Next, we're in yet for another um, fabulous presentation. Um, we were so lucky to have Esther Kim here visiting. Esther is uh, really an accomplished investigator. Her areas of expertise, in addition to SCAD, include fibromuscular dysplasia. And she is also leading the steering committee for the iSCAD um, registry, which she will talk about a bit. And, and the core of her presentation is really going to be discussing fibromuscular dysplasia. We know it affects many of you in the audience and its relationship to SCAD after Esther's presentation. I promise you we'll have a break. Uh, there'll be coffee again and cookies, like I said. Uh, we'll take a little break and then we'll resume for the remainder of the program. So uh, Esther's here from Vanderbilt where she is um, an associate professor of medicine and um, really look forward to hearing your comments, Esther. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, can you hear me? All right, I'm short, so this is what I look like. <laughs> because you won't see me behind the screen. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and um, I'm a cardiologist and a vascular medicine specialist, and I have been in the FMD space for over 10 years. Um, but when I started seeing patients with coronary dissection and also realizing, even before Dr. Saw started publishing her things, that my patients with FMD were having these heart attacks, um, it was a perfect marriage of my cardiology interests and my FMD interests. And so um, I'm just going to share with you some of the basics of the vascular, the extra coronary pieces um, of coronary dissection. So today, all right, SCAD and FMD. So the cause of SCAD is unknown. However, SCAD may be a presentation of an underlying arterial disease in some people. And what do I mean by underlying arterial disease? It's sort of what um, was hinted at. This word arteriopathy means disease of the arteries. And it means a predisposition for these arteries to be weakened um, and to form blockages, tears, and aneurysms. So we have to ask ourselves, is SCAD a disease in isolation? Is it something where it just affects the heart? You have a heart attack and you don't really have to think about any other diseases. I'm going to come up with some of the data that shown that SCAD is not a disease in isolation. This is actually um, the first publication showing SCAD next to a picture of FMD. And I'll never forget, I was a cardiology fellow at Cleveland Clinic. And we were at the FMD conference. Brad's here. You might have remembered this. Dr. Bueller came. And he was showing all these cases of coronary dissection and, you know, these patients with fibromuscular dysplasia. And could it be fibromuscular dysplasia of the coronaries? And Dr. Gornick and I turned and looked at each other and said, oh, no. Because all of a sudden we knew we were going to get so many phone calls the next day. Do I need to get my heart checked? Um, Fortunately, SCAD does not affect the vast majority of patients with FMD, but I do think it's a presentation of FMD. So interestingly, this is the first picture showing a SCAD angiogram next to a picture of FMD, that beaded appearance of the renal artery here. This is the kidney artery. However, um, interestingly enough, uh, back then, they wrote in their paper that coronary dissection is a condition that we considered to be the cause of this abnormal angiogram. However, none of the patients demonstrated the angiographic findings of a double lumen, spiral lucency, or contrast staining, that type 1 SCAD that you saw earlier. So this is a picture of SCAD, but we didn't know it was SCAD. And so we've come a long way um, since Dr. Bueller published this. So. Dr. Saw and Dr. Bueller were actually in the same practice in Canada, and she wanted to publish more of these cases of SCAD and FMD, but she had to prove to people that this was actually coronary dissection. And this, I think, is really where the, the tides turned, because we were able to show that now these long, smooth lesions these funny looking things without the tear that you can see with the dye staining, when we used OCT, which is the camera down the artery looking at the artery walls. You can see the tear there, and you can see what I call a bruise in the artery, that intramural hematoma. She was able to demonstrate that even though we don't see that flap, I think we're okay back there, even though we don't see that flap, this is still coronary dissection. So we see coronary dissection, but can you actually see FMD in the coronary arteries? Well, it turns out maybe we can. So um, do you guys notice how these coronary arteries and a lot of the angiograms that we saw today were very 
twisty looking, what we call tortuous. I tell my patients that their coronary arteries look like they got a perm. And that's what a lot of your angiograms look like. And I think that is suggestive of an underlying arteriopathy. And what we see um, very, very rarely, I would say less than one to 2% of the time is actual beating of that coronary artery. More frequently, we'll see the perm on the, the artery, we'll see these loops, um, and we'll see the tears in the artery. So Dr. Saw with her OCT catheter again, is looking down these arteries of patients with FMD. And if they had a history of SCAD, she looked down arteries that did not have dissection. And sure enough, she's finding these arteries are not normal structurally. So, you know, there are things like um, duplication of membranes, there's infiltration of the vessel with unusual maybe proteins, there's um, small blood vessels that really we don't see in normal arteries. So the architecture and the structure of the coronary arteries themselves may not be normal. If you look at a population of patients who've had a SCAD, and then you do a CAT scan from head to pelvis, or if you do an ultrasound or whatever study, how frequently will we find fibromuscular dysplasia or an aneurysm or a dissection somewhere else? So in this Mayo, Mayo cohort um, that was published, we see that three quarters of patients will have an extra coronary finding. So it's an aneurysm, a dissection, vessel tortuosity, a blockage. And in Dr. Um, Saw's cohort, she found fibromuscular dysplasia um, in about 60% of patients. And this is from um, a review article that um, a fellow and I wrote earlier this year. And these are all pictures of patients who've had coronary dissection. We see a brain aneurysm. We see a tear in the artery of the vertebral artery. We see a very tortuous carotid artery. We see aneurysms in the internal carotid artery very high up. We see a dissection and a dissecting aneurysm in a gut artery. So, you know, you think SCAD is just the heart, but really we need to be looking outside of the heart to get the whole picture. The other question is, you know, there's not a perfect test for FMD. So if you look for FMD with an ultrasound, your sensitivity is not going to be very high, maybe half the time. And that's if the sonographer is really good and the doctor is really good. Then you may look with an MRI, and depending on how good the MRI machine is and how good the protocol is, you may not detect FMD. And even with CTAs, if you have a very, very new fancy CT scan and a radiologist who knows what they're doing, they may diagnose FMD. Um, not everyone has the advantage of seeing so many FMD patients that when they look at a CT scan, they can kind of detect things that maybe the radiologist has missed. So we're seeing these numbers 60, 70%, but we're kind of taking that whole population of patients. This is registry. So these CAT scans were done many different places, and there's variability in the diagnosis. Um, so there's no blood test, there's no gene. So how much of SCAD is FMD? I can't tell you, but I would say the majority um, if we look at these numbers. Most recently, this is um, a I have a couple pictures here. So this is a publication from 1965. And oh, I didn't realize my <laughs> mouse is not working. So the picture on the right is from 1965. And that is an autopsy specimen um, from a patient who actually died from an abrupt heart attack. And when they looked at the coronary artery, they see a marked thickening of the wall. And that's fibromuscular dysplasia. And then to the left of that is something published from 1987 in a really, really sick younger man um, who died of a colonic rupture. But when they looked at his heart, they found in the same places where he had coronary dissection, they found areas that look like FMD. So there's some evidence there that the dissection can run along with fibromuscular dysplasia. And then in this publication by Dr. Saw and her group, um, this is an autopsy picture of a patient who had a coronary dissection. And you can see right here, is the dissection, the hematoma, that bruise in the artery and how the artery has been squashed because of that bruise. And in the kidney artery, we can see these ridges um, that are characteristic of multifocal fibromuscular dysplasia. So what is fibromuscular dysplasia? It's non-inflammatory, meaning it, it's not like lupus or scleroderma where you have antibodies against your own body. It's non-atherosclerotic. It's not from cholesterol. It's not from hypertension. It's not from all the other things that cause um, regular heart attacks or strokes. Um, and it can manifest as blockages, tears, or aneurysms. And it used to be that you had to 
find FMD under the microscope. But in the 1960s at Cleveland Clinic, actually, um, the pathologists were able to correlate these histologic findings with these angiographic findings. So now, um, when we see the classic findings of FMD on an angiogram, we can say this is FMD and not have to have like a biopsy sample or a surgical sample. The most common type of FMD is the medial type. 90% of patients have medial FMD. Um, but nowadays, if you have a string of pearls, uh, we call that multifocal FMD. And when you read these SCAD studies, the majority of patients have this multifocal FMD. Some patients have this intimal FMD, which is much rarer and can look like just a single stenosis. Um, and so these can be diagnosed as atherosclerosis, these lesions here, if people really don't know what they're uh, looking at. So the new nomenclature is multifocal and focal, but the vast majority of patients have multifocal. So how does FMD present? Well, it presents kind of like SCAD. So look at the stats here, and I bet you'll, you'll recognize these. 90% women, mean age in the 50s, um, and it can span the lifespan, 18 to 86. And there's a significant delay in diagnosis because in contrast to the women in this room who've had, or men in this room who've had uh, an abrupt tear in the artery with a uh, heart attack, patients with FMD, the most common presentations are actually high blood pressure, headache, and a swooshing noise in their ears called pulsatile tinnitus, where it sounds like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And some of you may have that um, and recognize what I'm talking about. And so because these symptoms are sort of nonspecific, doctors don't really know to look for a vascular cause. And it can take patients years and years and years and multiple doctors to finally make the diagnosis. Um, and certainly patients can present with heart attack, but they also present with stroke and many strokes as well. So just like... SCAD is not an isolated arteriopathy, neither is FMD. And in fact, we say that if you've got FMD in one place, so the kidney artery, and you look up in the neck, two thirds of patients will have FMD in their carotids and vice versa. And you can see that the renal arteries, we all learned in medical school that if you have a young pregnant person who becomes hypertensive and you can't control their hypertension, it's a young woman with hypertension, we think about FMD, the kidney arteries, but now we know it can really affect any medium-sized vascular bed. It rarely affects the aorta about 3% of patients with FMD of aortic involvement in the FMD registry. So it turns out that aneurysm and dissection are not rare in patients with FMD. So if you look at the registry and you add up all the uh, prevalence of aneurysm and dissection, one out of five will at least have what, at least one aneurysm. One out of four will have had at least one dissection. If you put them all together, four out of 10 will have had either one or the other. So FMD is not just a benign cause of high blood pressure. It is a significant arteriopathy and can have significant presentations. And as um, and to state that fact, you know, it's a morbid disease in the sense that patients have strokes, heart attacks. They can even have things like renal infarctions, where they can have a tear of the kidney artery that can cause a part of their kidney to die. And um, as has been shown in the SCAD literature, when patients with SCAD have interventions, they are more prone to getting injury from the procedure itself, something that we call iatrogenic injury, where the wire or the puncture of the artery can cause a tear. And patients with FMD also have that complication. And this is a study that was done in Europe. Um, and what they found is that if you do look elsewhere, if a patient has FMD and you look elsewhere, half the time you're going to find beating in another bed. Two thirds of the time you're going to find beating or dissection or aneurysm. Um, and 35% of single site FMD, that means FMD just in one arterial bed, they had an aneurysm or a dissection somewhere else. So what is the, the practice? So certainly if you have FMD, I screen you from head to pelvis, but our HA scientific statement that came out, we made a very um, clear advocate for um, screening head to pelvis if you've had a SCAD. And this is because we know that we may find other things. And I prefer CTA because the sensitivity, it tends to, um, the slices of the CTA tend to help us make the diagnosis a little better um, than MRA or ultrasound. And after we make the diagnosis of FMD or aneurysm, then we try to use things like ultrasound to follow those lesions to prevent uh, radiation exposure. And sometimes, you, you know, doing the head to pelvis CTA doesn't give the diagnosis. The doctor actually has to be a doctor. This is an example of a patient who um, had FMD somewhere else, but we listened to the arm 
and there was that swooshing noise in the arm, and she had brachial FMD. So it can affect um, other arteries as well. So we know that SCAD, if you have a SCAD, half to 86% of the time, that's sort of the world's literature, that's the range. Um, a lot of patients with SCAD have FMD, but if we look at patients with FMD in the FMD registry, less than 3% have had SCAD, I think that's going to change because the more SCAD patients FMD doctors are seeing, the more that's being reported in the FMD registry. So clearly we need more research to under better understand this relationship and exactly the strength of that relationship. So I want to kind of move on to that. You know, what are the barriers to advancement of science for rare disease? I think small, pa small patient populations. So a general cardiologist may see one or two cases in their careers. Um, geographic disbursement of patients. The United States is huge, and patients are scattered everywhere. Not everyone lives very close to a tertiary or quaternary cardiology center. Very few individuals know about SCAD, um, and they're kind of in their ivory towers of medicine, I would say. Um, and there's lack of funding, as Dr. Saw said, generalizability for the population at large. Um, drug companies and scent companies want to sell their product. And so if you've only got a small number of patients to sell to, that's not really attractive uh, compared to atherosclerotic disease. But what are some of the things that we can do to get beyond that? Well, you have to have a disease champion. And all of you in this room are disease champions because you care. You're here supporting other patients. Um, and some of you are professional yet unpaid advocates who make it your life, uh, like Catherine Leon. Um, there has to be collaboration. Physicians have to work with other physicians, Dr. Saw and I, Dr. Wood and I, and Dr. Wood and Dr. Saw. We have to come together to work together because no, no one single person can see the number of patients necessary to have meaningful research. Um, we have to have patient-physician interaction, um, just like today, um, where patient, uh, physicians are coming from Canada and from Tennessee all the way up to Boston so that we can make that connection and keep it strong. We need a mechanism for research funding. And so um, one of the inspirations for the US SCAD registry, the ISCAD registry, is this FMDSA registry. And uh, I've been a part of this um, since its inception and have enrolled hundreds of patients into this. Right now, I think the number is even more than 2,200, but we've got like 2,500 patients in this registry. And everything I know about FMD, I know because of this registry. And this was a patient-driven organization patient-driven advocacy-related research. Um, and so taking a cue from the FMD registry, we've really worked to get the ISCAD registry off the ground. And I know it's been mentioned um, a couple times today already. And um, the ISCAD registry is going to be a multi-center registry across the United States. And we're hoping eventually that it'll become international. That's what the I stands for. Apple has no stake in our study, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish they did. Um, and so ISCAD um, is almost ready to launch. It's very exciting. It's being funded by SCAD Alliance which is the patient advocacy group. They've been pinching pennies for several years, and we're using this valuable money um, to pay the coordinating center. Fahad is with the Perfuse over there. Thank you for coming today. Um, Perfuse is the coordinating center at BIDMC, and they are going to take all this information from the patients from around the country, put it all together, spit out some data for us. Um, and I do think that having multiple registries on SCAD is really important because we need to um, keep each other accountable. We need to corroborate the data that's coming out. Um, and there are going to be some regional differences in care as well. So I think that having this multi-center SCAD registry is important. Um, the SCAD is being captured in the FMD registry as well. But the level of detail we need to help patients who've had a heart attack um, is really going to be from the ISCAD registry. And so you may be asked by your doctors to join both, and I would encourage you to do both because we they're collecting different information and we need to grow the information in both areas. So in summary, more than half the time, SCAD is not an isolated disease. And it's a presentation of FMD, but most patients with FMD have not experienced a SCAD. The link certainly requires more study, and patient-supported research is going to be the way that we're going to continue advancing the science. So thank you very much. <laughs>